you know, the pressure to de-dollarize and, you know, the, the World Gold Council coming out with that survey la late last year of all the central banks and the central banks saying we're dropping dollar reserves and moving to other forms. So dollar reserves should come down the next five years to about 40, 45 percent. Um, mm -hmm. Other currencies will emerge. I think gold is taken center stage. There's a lot of talking about gold in the financial system. Uh, a lot of talk about the central bank digital currencies and what that changeover is going to look like. You're listening to Carrie Lutz's Financial Survival Network, where you get valuable information you just can't find anywhere else. To thrive in today's trying times, you need the Financial Survival Network now more than ever. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and get your free newsletter and gift. Financial Survival Network now more than ever. And welcome. You are listening to and watching the Financial Survival Network. I'm your host, Kerry Lutz. Hey, well, we're here. We're almost midway through January. Uh, lots of stuff going on for sure. And uh, hey, we're touching base with Rob Kreitz to get to his view on what 2024 looks like. So far, uh, Robert, what do you think? What are you seeing for this year? Well, I think, you know, being a gold silver guy, there's a lot of standing on the sidelines of people uh, with their money waiting to see what's going to happen this year. I think people are waiting to see, is the Fed really going to cut interest rates like they've hinted at? Is inflation going to spark back up? We've had some inflation sort of peek back into, you know, the numbers. We're starting to hear layoffs. I have a, I, I know people that work at City, for example, and I don't know if this has hit the airwaves yet, but City's just announced 20,000 layoffs uh, mm -hmm. to try to save $2 billion over the next couple of years. Uh, the restructuring, uh, and I think also had a recent deal with, with Banamec. So that's part of the restructuring too. And I think the banks, I, I think what we're going to see is the banks start to come under pressure. Um, there, you know, a lot of been, what I've been reporting on the last several weeks has been um, the bank unrealized losses on assets uh, is the highest it's been in a very long time. Uh, banks have had about almost a trillion dollars of commercial deposit money come out. A lot of that's yeah. moved into, you know, money markets for the, for the repo market, but Mm -hmm. There seems to be a little bit less liquidity in the system. If you look at everything, there's less liquidity in the system, and that tends to affect banks, I guess is what I'm getting at. For With sure. the repo market, uh, the reverse repo is coming down because interest rates are higher. With the amount of commercial deposit money being taken out, with some of the underperforming assets, particularly de debt-based assets, mortgage assets, student loan assets, I think the banks are going to come under a lot of pressure, and I think that's probably going to be the story Again, this spring, just like it was last spring, we're going to see some more issues in the banking systems. Yeah, well, it, we've never really stopped seeing them since uh, this latest round. Uh, you look at the emergency fund, which was quote unquote temporary. Looks like yeah. it's becoming more and more permanent. And uh, the balance there, the collateral uh, goes up every single week. That's not a sign of a healthy sector, is it? No, it's not. And you know, it makes sense. We're in a debt-based system. So as you get a little bit longer into that system, especially you go 14, 15 years between recessions, eventually what happens is debt, debt and debt pressure uh, builds up in the system. And I think when you look at inflation, it really tied the hands of the banking system because inflation forced the Fed basically to kick up le its lending rate. And then also on top of that, offer all of these other programs like the bank term funding program, uh, getting involved more involved in the repo market to try to inject some liquidity in there. I think what the Fed is trying to do, along with the FDIC and the Treasury to some extent, is trying to sort of stabilize the banking system as we hit some rough patches. But I just don't know, depending on how the economy does this year, uh, I don't know how, how long the banks can go without there being some additional probably banking failures. And I don't know to what extent or size we're going to see them. But I think that they're going to come under pressure. They're holding a bunch of debt that's underperforming right now, and the the increased interest rate is not working in their favor. They're not able to offer, for example, increased interest rates to their commercial depositors. Mm -hmm. So what we're seeing is an interest rate gap, and people are hunting for a return. And so that's that's caused some challenges with the banks. I think it's caused banks and even uh, entities like pension funds to become a little bit more uh, risk on with their methodologies for investing. And I. You know, it'll be interesting this year to see how a lot of that turns out in the financial sector. You know, how healthy was some of that investing in the last few years, hunting for a return? Uh, how did the commercial deposit flight affect the bank's balance sheets? Is there a, enough bad debt between mortgage debt, credit card debt, student loan debt that, uh, and maybe even some, you know, foreign investments that's going to cause the banks to uh, come under cash crunches? Uh, how much would the government have to get involved? I think that's probably going to be the story, at least of the first half of the year, I would imagine. 
Hey, and if you look at China, you know, you're seeing unaddressed bank failures there, like all over the place. People cannot get their money out of banks that yeah. shut down. They don't even uh, attempt to like uh, show they're in control, you know? Uh, a lot different there than here, for sure. Yeah, I think one of the advantages China has is they built up that Belt and Road Initiative and the BRICS trade and, and all of those things. And so th their economy is not doing particularly well, by the way. I mean, the real estate yeah. market over in China is an absolute mess, but they do have some advantages. They're not the world reserve currency. Um, they, <laughs> that was an advantage. <laughs> I think it's becoming an advantage. Yeah, the dollar's coming under a lot of pressure and, you know, the pressure to de-dollarize and, you know, the, the World Gold Council coming out with that survey la late last year of all the central banks and the central banks saying we're dropping dollar reserves and moving to other forms. So dollar reserves should come down the next five years to about 40, 45%. Um, mm -hmm. Other currencies will emerge. I think gold is taking center stage. There's a lot of talking about gold in the financial system. Uh, a lot of talk about the central bank digital currencies and what that changeover is going to look like. Uh, the BIS has a huge amount of information on their website available about all the projects they've been running to implement the CBDCs. Uh, the Fed is involved, even though the Fed has said publicly we're not involved in this their name is actually on some of those bis projects and they're testing cross-border payments and things like that so i i think Harry, what we're really seeing is sort of this realization that the existing system is sort of fading away a bit and then there needs to be a new system a new sort of bretton woods if you will and this time however i think the rest of the world's kind of taken it into their own hands and saying let's help develop this system proactively rather than waiting for that other shoe to drop with the dollar and so I think the central bank digital currency regime is sort of the response of the world to say, we don't want one dominant currency. We want all of the currencies to trade around, but we also want more control over aggregate money supply. Right. And so I think that system has been engineered ostensibly to sort of solve some problems with the dollar system, which it looks like it may on its way out. And a lot of what we see in our economy is a result of the, you know, the trouble with the dollar and the debt system. Sure. Yeah. Well, uh, there's fun all over, but you know, these transitions don't just happen like so easily, right? Uh, it takes time mm -hmm. and it takes a lot of volatility, a lot of uncertainty, yeah. a lot of crashes, right? Yeah. So, but it looks like everything's crashing all at once here. Yeah. I think the three big pillars of our economy, you know, real estate bonds and stocks are, are all to some extent coming under pressure. Last year, the Dow Jones uh, and the Russell probably suffered the most. The S&P and NASDAQ were okay. They had end-year rallies. Mm -hmm. But, you know, part of this, the, the the manufacturing sector of the economy is completely cratered at this point. Yeah. Um, there is, you know, but within that, some people are repatriating their manufacturing or they're moving it from China to Mexico. So there is some move to bring some manufacturing back to North America, but it's not fast enough to recover, you know, what we had lost. The service economy is sort of holding serve, but you can start to see pressure in that part of the economy. Right. And it looks as though the economy is just weakening. It looks like we're going to a typical recessionary phase. The real, the, the big question is really, what does the Fed do? How do they react? Yeah. If we're going to go through a multi-stage inflationary mm -hmm. recession like we went through in the 70s, will how the Fed responds and when they respond, that really is going to determine, I think, how much pain we all sort of see here in terms of inflation, interest rates. And if the Fed... You know, if the Fed can ease, they will. But if inflation goes up, they're they're between a rock and a hard place. And you can't ease into inflation because you have to worry about runaway inflation. You have to worry about easing into an uh, economy that's already maybe chugging too hard and needs to have a reset and needs to have, mm -hmm. you know, some loss and some bankruptcies and things to clean things up. So I think it's going to be hard for the Fed to try to cut rates. I think they're going to be fighting increased inflation. They're going to be stuck between a rock and a hard place. But depending upon the timing of their moves really is how th these other markets are going to react. Um, if we're still in a tightening, or even if we stay where we are, you know, with interest rates hovering around treasuries four to five percent, you know, the federal funds rate over five percent, it's going to make it challenging for growth. Mm -hmm. So they're going to want to ease, but if we have inflation, it's going to be difficult to ease. So this year, I think, like I, I agree with what you said, we're going to have a lot of turbulence. We're going to have a lot of wild swings as people try to figure out positioning and people try to figure out they're hunting for return. Where do I go in the market? It, it, you've seen it in the gold market. Gold a few weeks ago hit a new all-time high of like twenty one sixty. And it was on the Sunday night open. And and then the next few days, it got slammed down by $130, $140. So you're starting to see volatility in that asset. Why? Because gold is a safe haven. So yeah. some people are considering moving into it. Some of the market's not buying into it. And I think that's what we're going to see. But 
maybe five or six months into the year, we'll kind of know how all the different asset classes are going to do this year. Uh, but the really interesting thing will be, you know, in the fall going into the election, uh, in 2008, we had an election and the economy didn't do too so well there. So will our economy hold up through the election? I don't know. It might, but there were so many problems in it that I think the, you know, the governmental powers of be are going to have a hard time sort of managing that and making sure that they can keep that strong economy heading into right. the next month. Not to mention uh, hey, the deficit's like totally out of control, right? Yeah. the de- I mean, under Biden, you know, to be fair, it's it's been bad since President Reagan. I mean, it started with President yeah. Reagan. Every president thereafter is added to the debt, right? It's been that no president is or Congress has been immune from this. But the amount of debt that we have now under this administration is just uh, debilitating because I don't know how you recover from it. I don't. How do you recover from 34 trillion? How do you recover from the deficits that are running? And now we want to spend more on, on foreign wars Yeah. at a time in which we probably need, if anything, to retract and, and get more fiscally responsible. Yeah, well, you make an excellent case for gold and the loss of faith in the government. Uh, you know, yeah. Ar- Armstrong often says it's not inflation that causes precious metals prices to uh, increase. It's loss of faith in the system, in the government. We're certainly seeing that now. Yes, we are. We're seeing a lot of, uh, I, you know, I think culturally and politically, what happens economically usually filters into culture and politics. And we're seeing, you know, more uh, pushback on the political system. Culturally, we're going through a lot of changes. I think if you if it just generation, generationally for a second, uh, the baby boomers and the wartime, the silent generation still have most of the wealth in the country. Uh, my generation's doing okay. Gen X, we're okay. Uh-huh. But the millennials and the Gen Zers are not, you know, and the millennials are now getting into their mid to late 30s. So uh-huh. they're not seeing the purchasing power and the wealth generation previous generations have. So part of what I think this economic cycle is going to tell us is how do the new generations fare, but how do the existing assets fare? If you're sitting there and you're you're a little bit older and you've, you know, got your pension, your 401k, your real estate, um, are your asset values going to hold up or is there going to be some sort of wealth transfer, you know, to other asset classes and who, you know, is going to capitalize on that? Is it going to be the Bitcoins of the world? Uh, is it going to be gold and silver? I was going to you raise that point. So Bitcoin, right? We got these spot ETFs. Mm-hmm. You know, who knows if the, uh, you know, you got to be so skeptical at this point, even though it violates every law, but uh, they could be, uh, you know, showing numbers have no relation to what's really taking place there. They could be buying buying these things, but they're buying them through some other coin, stable coin, whatever. And how do you there's there's so little transparency in the system now as it is with these ETFs. And actually it's an ETP. I don't know what the difference is, but uh, they're calling they're not calling it an ETF. They're calling it an ETP, which uh which Stand- not a fund, it's a project, maybe yeah, or a product. product. Ex- <laughs> exchange traded product, right? Uh, are types of securities that track underlying securities, an index or other financial instruments. So they track it. So they're not necessarily buying and holding the stuff, they're tracking it. It seems to me it's a recipe for major manipulation in the crypto markets. Yeah, a lot of the derivative complex, whether it be, you know, I talk about comex and the commodity markets all the time because i'm a gold guy but if you look at the entire derivative complex it's a lever in the system and and if you have enough money with that lever you can move the system around so you can actually move pricing around you can move you know pricing and availability of assets uh if you have enough power you can pick winners and um and if you don't have enough power you're probably the patsy at the poker table or you're probably losing your money <laughs> yeah we we see this in the commodity markets all the time the management the big financial houses they have all the money in society but they get taken advantage of by the the bullion banks all the time who have the information, mm-hmm. and um, because the the pockets up to this point of the managed money in the financial houses had been deep, they could afford to lose money on some of these derivative trades. But as things tighten up, I think what we're seeing is there is a there's a bit of mistrust and anger and frustration brewing at the system itself because the system being the way that it is set up the way that it is really is set to benefit the ones that manage the monetary flows. And a lot of people who aren't benefiting from that are starting to say, wait a minute, we have issues with this. So, you know, you've had the the manipulation charge against uh, one of the big banks, JP Morgan, a billion dollars, 920 million they had to pay for manipulating treasuries and gold. You know, what's to say that 
the banks or other financial houses aren't going to manipulate, you know, Bitcoin. And and the, the key question I have is I understand people that support Bitcoin wanting the ETPs because it will bring institutional investment and it may help stabilize. They think it may help stabilize those assets. But the problem is, wasn't Bitcoin supposed to be this yeah. decentralized DeFi, yeah, right. DeFi, decentralized finance? But aren't we putting it into the same centralized scheme that everything else is? So I don't I don't know what to think about that in terms of whether I know it's going to bring money into Bitcoin, but is it going to make it maybe perhaps more manipulated and more unstable? Hey, is you know, it's a uh, they're even corrupting the blockchain here. Yeah, <laughs> right. They're even. They said they couldn't do it, but I, all you have to do is change the laws and financialize stuff, and I think you can pretty much control anything. And I think that's going to be a surprise to some people. Hey, show me something that hasn't been financialized. You know, yeah, credit card receivables. You know that they sell them off, uh, all these things, and uh, the banks have just become arbitragers, basically, right? Yeah, uh, arbitragers and money changers. So make money on the transactions, and yeah. also provide a lot of the insurance. Well, the funny thing about the banks is they provide this consulting and the money. So if you think about it, they do the research reports to tell people what to get into. They handle all the money for all the things that people are getting into <laughs> and yeah, then and they move the prices around on the things yeah. that people are getting into. So and that should be your so. first clue is anytime you try to ETF or ETP something, uh, who's, you know, who's going to benefit from that. It's always going to be the financial complex. Yeah. No, I couldn't agree with you more. It's, it's just, uh, it's like through the looking glass here, everything is so distorted and so, uh, you know, just volatile, corrupted, all of that. So, hey, where you, we got two thousand gold now, but we don't have uh, fifty dollars silver. Mm -hmm. uh, what's ahead for the coming year? Well, I think you'll notice, like in the the way that you'll know if the market believes in the gold story, it, a couple of confirming signals are one, silver and the mining stocks. Um, silver briefly responded over twenty five, but didn't stick. Because I don't think gold's march up to a new all-time high was particularly, um, there wasn't story around it. Yeah. So it happened, but it kind of happened quietly. It wasn't like people were paying attention. There was one big event. It's not like like Credit Suisse defaulted and gold shot up. It was just right. the flow steady climb. So, you know, the, the market itself said, eh, you know, gold very quietly had an all-time high. But, you know, why would I want gold? So silver, I don't think silver is going to move about 25 and into 30 and into 40 until we have gold sitting at a new all-time high about 21 50 60 and staying there for some length of time maybe having a monthly close or maybe there's enough news in the news cycle that people start really thinking about gold in their own portfolios but it's interesting in the fourth quarter of last year we did have a little bit of recovering mining stocks for the first time in years since really 2020 yeah have the mining stocks started to gain some momentum and a lot of that's because the gold ones are making money because gold at $2,000, almost every yeah. project's making money. Silver, not so much. So you still have a lot of the juniors and the smaller ones not making money, but the established companies are doing well. So you see the, the gold mining indices, indices start to move. So I think we've got interest in the gold space, anywhere from getting it out of the ground to buying the final product. But there has to be that story as to why gold and silver really need to hit their last stage. And I think we're moving into the last stage of this gold and silver cycle that started around 2000, around the tech crash, you know, and gold has beaten most of the stock market over the last 23 years in terms of, True. yeah, it's above it by 20 or 30% percent last time I look. So uh, it's, it's priced in more of the risk of the system than the rest of the investments have. But I think if that story around 2024 is more volatility, like we've been talking about some bank issues, uh, inflation leading up to the presidential election, any sort of cultural uncertainty or political geopolitical uncertainty around what's going on in our country with riots or what's going on overseas with wars. I think that will buoy, you know, the case for gold. And I think that's probably going to happen in 2024. I think gold for 2024 and silver are going to do very, very well just because of that volatility. And I think people are going to start rotating into that, those asset classes. Yeah, I think you're correct. I agree with you, but we, <laughs> we've been waiting for this for quite a long time and once it finally starts happening, it's hard to believe that it's actually happening. But I, th I agree with you. I think it is happening here. Yeah, I think it is. And well, it'd just be interesting to see, Kerry, how far that rabbit hole we go. You know, the Fed's talking about soft landing. I don't think you can have a soft landing, but how hard will the landing be? I don't know. 
Mm-hmm. That's really the the question I have. But I think 2024 is going to give us those clues. If 2024 is really volatile uh, and we do see more bank failures and the U.S. continues to uh, spend without any sort of restraint, then I think you could say the last half of 2024 and 2025 are going to be very interesting. Interesting may live in interesting times, as the Chinese are so fond of saying. Hey, Rob, it's been great having you on here. Just to tell us where we find you, how we connect with you on the web. Yeah, so I run the website www.goldsilverpros.com. That's an online bullion shop as well as a blog. And we have social media on YouTube and Twitter as well. You can find us there. We do videos every week. And we basically, we're a research channel. We put a lot of research out around macroeconomics and the economic cycle, investing in and gold and silver. So you can find us just anywhere in your popular social media. All right. Very cool. Hey, got a question for Robert or myself? Shoot me an email, kl at kerryletz.com. You'll find the link right to his site in the show notes to this interview on financialsurvivalnetwork.com. And please take advantage of our free newsletter. Send it out weekly, sometimes a little more. Robert, it's always great having you on, and we will talk to you again real soon. Thanks so much, Kerry. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to Kerry Lutz's Financial Survival Network, your solution to today's trying times. For the latest, go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com. Financial Survival Network, now more than ever.